Uh, Leslie is um, a professor emeritus at Mendocino College in the area of dance and Native American art. Uh, she's also taught at San, uh, Sonoma State University as a lecturer in dance history and dance and world cultures. Um, she retired about four years ago from, from teaching. Um, so after 35 years of uh, a career at Mendocino College, um, uh, she has developed a, a very keen interest in dance uh, and world cultures. And that led her to the Pacific Northwest about 20 years ago, uh, where she spent a year researching and um, uh, studying uh, mass dances of several tribal cultures in that area. Uh, on, upon her return to Ukiah, she collaborated with Sherry Smith Ferry, the former director of the Grace Hudson Museum, and Paula Gray, who's a professor emeritus uh, at Mendocino College in art history and studio art. Um, and they collaborated on a program, a community event entitled Behind the Masks which focused on art and culture of the native peoples of the Northwest Coast. And it was through those studies that uh, Leslie developed a very keen interest in uh, the art of and cultures of the Arctic peoples of uh, North America. And she's traveled to many remote communities in both in Alaska and across Canada. Last summer, uh, she, uh, spent uh, a lot of time traveling with her husband, Alan, in the Siberian Arctic. Uh, and so she's learned a lot about Inuit and, and Arctic cultures and the arts of culture. Uh, so um, uh, four years ago, Leslie curated an exhibit for Mendocino Art Gallery, a Mendocino College Art Gallery called The Stark Abundance Through the Eyes of Arctic First Peoples. Uh, so if you will all join me in a round of virtual applause and help us welcome uh, to our podium, Leslie Saxon West. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm seeing names of um, friends and colleagues. I'm getting a little teary. I'm realizing how much I miss everyone. Um, but at least I'm glad to join you um, for this presentation. All right. Well, again, welcome. Um, it's it's wonderful to be here during this difficult time. Um, as uh, both David and Alyssa mentioned to you, um, this is a first for us. I am accustomed to standing in a classroom and um, interacting with my students. And I, I have to admit, it feels very strange to be sitting here just looking at my computer. Um, at my PowerPoint. Um, I expect this might be a little stumbly. So again, this is this is our first try at this. And I know you'll be patient with us. Um, I'm calling this presentation Pictures from Stone, Inuit Art and Printmaking. Um, as you may know, I was supposed to give this presentation live at the museum back in April. Um, and my presentation was to coincide with um, a really wonderful exhibit at the Grace Hudson Museum um, that contained a variety of beautiful Native American prints. And of course, we were not able to do that. We know why. Um, so uh, here I am <laughs> doing it now. Hopefully, uh, those of you who are sitting in today had a chance to see that wonderful exhibit. Um, and you may recall, you may remember these two images um, that I'm showing you right here on this um, front page. These were the two prints, the two Inuit prints that were um, actually in that exhibit. So, um, with that, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Um, again, be patient. As I said, I think this is going to be a little stumbly. Um, keep in mind that um, this, is, this is at least a semester long course and we're trying to jam it into about an hour. So um, we're going to be general and um, just call it a drive-by course. 
Uh, first, I, I want to thank several people. You can take a look at this on your own, but um, I want to emphasize um, the importance um, and my, my gratefulness for um, the um, traditional homeland of the normal, the Northern Pomo peoples on which we are giving this presentation tonight. And I want to pay respect to the elders, both past and present. All right, so here we go. Um, again, I'm thrilled to share some of my thoughts about the Inuit people of Canada with you tonight, their history, their culture, their artistic traditions. I think you'll appreciate the art uh, that they create and will find their story of art making to be absolutely fascinating. Um, I, am, I am and have always been very inspired actually by all Native peoples and uh, their ingenuity, what they create and um, what they uh, create as art. Um, but I think especially there's something about the Arctic that um, has always um, been, been very exciting to me. So what I've listed here first is um, some questions. And I'm hoping that we will be able to answer these questions as we go through things tonight. And, and these are the questions. Who are Inuit people and where do they live? Where did they come from? Why did people stay in this harsh environment? Historical considerations. How does art fit into all of this? Why do we call this presentation pictures from stone? And how does printmaking relate to this? So let's see if we can answer some of these questions. So who are the Inuit people and where do they live? Um, if you are like most people, you are imagining people who live far away in a very cold, remote and um, rugged area, and it is that. Um, specifically, Inuit people are a group of culturally similar peoples inhabiting um, the Arctic regions of Siberia, Greenland, Canada, and Alaska. And I will say that I've actually visited all of those places except for Greenland, and we're hoping to go there this coming summer. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, we will be focusing on the Inuit people of, um, of Canada. So we want to um, establish some context here before we start looking at art. Um, it's, um, you know, with many forms of art, in order to understand and appreciate it, we have to first develop an understanding of who we're talking about who made it, where it was made, how it was made, from what it was made, and perhaps why it was made. And um, that's hopefully what we will discover tonight for the people and then what they create. So first, um, you see here some, some definitions. So um, we are focusing on the indigenous people of the Arctic in Canada and they refer to themselves as Inuit or Inuit people. Um, another commonly used term is Eskimo. Um, I think this is a little older term. Um, it is derogatory. It's considered derogatory um, if you're in Canada. However, if you're in Alaska, uh, generally Alaskan Native people prefer to be called Eskimo. Um, although I, I actually think that's changing a little bit. Um, if we refer to an Inuk, we'll be referring to an Inuit person. And the native language of the um, Inuit people is Inuktitut. All right, so I want to hold on, I need to get rid of something. Oops, no. So here you see um, a portion of Northern Canada. 
And the blue and purple areas are um, an area called Nanunga. This is the Inuit homeland of Canada. There are four regions in this area, Anuvialut, Nunavut, Nunavik, and Nunatsiavut. Within these four regions are 53 settled Inuit communities, um, most of which are, are fewer than uh, 500 people. A couple are a little bit larger than that. Um, and the majority of Canadian Inuit live in these communities. In the 1970s, um, negotiations began for the Inuit land claim movement, and, and that's, that's a, a long, drawn out history that I won't go into, but it did eventually bring about a partnership between the Canadian government and the Inuit. And um, it ensures then and now that um, there, that the Inuit and Canadian government share in complex uh, decision-making roles and responsibilities in the management of land and waters in this area. So the focus this evening is going to be on um, the region of Nunavut. And in these maps here, you can see in red that one of four areas in Canada, Canadian Arctic. Um, and then you see a bigger map that's a little bit more detailed of Nunavut. And then over on the right part of your screen, you see um, um, an area, an island, and it's called Baffin Island. And we're going to focus on that island tonight and a particular area, um, Cape Dorset, which I will tell you about very soon. Um, this is a great picture of the flag of Nunavut. And um, you might be asking yourself what that, um, that red image is on the flag. And I'm going to tell you in just a few minutes. All right, so where did um, where did the in, uh, indigenous people of the Arctic come from? You can tell by this picture that it looks like somebody is traveling a distance from one place to another. And um, in fact, scientists believe that there was human migration from Asia to North America across a land bridge connecting Siberia and Alaska. And this was called the Bering Land Bridge. And it was eventually covered by water from glacial ice and is still covered by water. And here is another map. So the first people it's thought who came from Siberia to Alaska to North America were pre-Dorset uh, culture and the, then the Dorset culture a little later on, and then a little later on the Thule culture. And that movement uh, began from Siberia going east into Alaska between 4,000 and 4,500 years ago. But it's always important to remember that although scientists um, definitely have um, um, can tell us certain things <laughs> about people moving um, from place to place, but we also have to acknowledge that Native peoples also have their own stories and their own beliefs, their creation so stories as to how they um, how they came to be where they are. And it's always important to remember that. All right, so what is so attractive about living in this area? What is it like to live in the Arctic? And if we were in class together, I would be asking you to describe the picture that you have in your mind of um, what that would be like. But since we can't do that, I'll let you just kind of do that on your own. So the term I like to use for the Arctic, um, and I, I have, my husband and I have done a lot of tra traveling to, to remote areas in Arctic communities, um, is stark abundance. 
And although it's stark, yes, the landscape is stark. Um, it is vast, it's ice, it's snow, it's endless sky, it's endless rock. Um, and I'll just stop here for a minute and tell you what this is. This is an Inukshuk. And um, these are stone markers. When you travel in Nunavut, you see, um, you see these stone markers all over the place. And again, I mean, you can, you can just, you look for miles and miles endlessly. And all you see is rock or ice. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one of these beautiful little stone markers pops up. And, and they really are just that. They, they communicate something to a traveler, something about where they are or something about where they want to go. You can imagine um, it's icy. There are no landmarks around. Things are covered with snow. You don't know where you are. And if you know how to read these Inuksuit, um, you, um, you might you might learn something about where you are and where you're going. Um, it might tell you that you're, you're heading into a dangerous area or perhaps a safe area. Um, it might tell you that uh, there's, a, there's a food cache nearby or that um, there's a spring nearby. It might have some kind of spiritual um, significance that might be important. So it's an important language to know. It's not an, a language that we're familiar with, but the Inuit people are very familiar with this language. And when they travel in these vast, remote, secluded areas, um, they can often, the, these markers help them sort of find their way. And I also added this little image. I don't know if you can remember back to the Vancouver Olympics in 2010, but they used the Inukshuk as their uh, symbol for that. For those Olympics. Some more photos. Incidentally, a lot of these photos are, um, are photos that I've taken in my travels. But the Arctic is, um, is not a frozen wasteland. And this is one of the things that I just truly love about the Arctic. There are many things, but um, although it seems lifeless at times and stark, um, if you look really carefully, if you open your eyes and, and you look really carefully, you see um, the most profound things, like a little poppy just popping out of rocks um, or other beautiful little plants. Um, and of course, animals. Um, that also can, can amazingly live in areas like this. This area has biodiversity greater than can be found in most other Northern Cal uh, locations. The prevailing conditions mean a year round renewable food supply accessible even in the dead of winter. And remember that Arctic areas are critical to the environment. They produce oxygen, and absorb carbon dioxide, all of which are essential for life, our life. Um, and temperature changes can influence that. So it's a very, um, a very fragile area. So abundance, and again, most if, of these photos, maybe all of these photos are my, not all of them, <laughs> are my photos, but um, an abundance of plants and animals. This is my picture. Now, this is not the Canadian Arctic. This I took last summer in Siberia. This is, I don't know if you know what this is. Again, if we were in class, I would ask you, but I'll tell you, this is a musk ox. They're only found in um, at just a handful of remote Arctic areas. These are mine too. These are my photos too. And these are from last summer from the Siberian Arctic. Yes, yes, there are polar bears. And in Siberia, we saw lots and lots of these um, profoundly amazing creatures, as well as walrus and whales. 
but there's people too. Um, it's abundant. The Arctic is abundant with human life, men, women, children, families, and communities. And these communities are rich in culture, traditional wisdom, and collective spirit. So um, we can't get too much into history. Um, there's just too much to talk about, but in general, Let's remember that native peoples inhabited North America before non-native people arrived. They spoke different languages and they had different customs and beliefs. In the 1500s, non-native explorers arrived in the Canadian Arctic. Settlers from different places began to arrive and to uh, trade with native peoples. Those settlers brought their religions, their values, their customs, and unfortunately, their diseases. And this is all a common story, right? Right? Not just in the Arctic, but uh, right here, <laughs> where we sit in Mendocino County and all of North America. It's a very uh, similar story. So um, before, before this started to happen, Inuit people lived out on the land. They had to live where they could find food. And um, food often moved around depending on the time of year. And so um, they, they had family subsistence based camps. And I'm going to show you um, some of these camps. So, so um, again, they uh, before moving to these settlements, which were established later on historically, the people lived in camps. And these camps were made up of um, immediate and extended family members. The camps would move depending on the season and the food avail availability in a particular place. And of course, they were nomadic. Depending on the time of year and how long the family would stay there, housing structures varied. And the most common of those housing structures was the sod, S-O-D, sod house. And that's what you see here. <clears throat> so sod houses were um, constructed uh, in a way uh, by, by digging a shallow depression um, into the sort of mossy, rocky, little bit of soil area. Um, once that was done, um, they would build a frame, often using bones, whale bones, and frequently the ribs of whales worked quite well for framing these structures. Um, they would then, and notice, um, in the, the, lower, the lower picture, there's a large bone, that's a whale skull, skull and I'll show, you, I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, so they would, they would build the frame and then around the frame, they would use other materials like rocks, stone, um, uh, more bone, moss, skin, they would layer it, trying to insulate it as well as possible. And um, they would often put, these are my pictures again. So when you're, when you're in these remote areas and you hike around, you can see remnants of these old villages and these old sod houses, which is what you're seeing here. Um, in the lower photograph, you see one of the, uh, the whale Skull, the skull of a whale, and um, that would have been the entrance to one of these sod houses. And upon entering, uh, I don't know if you can see, but they were they were sometimes two levels. So I don't know if you can see my arrow, my cursor arrow, but you see an upper area here, which would have been an area where the family may have slept, and a lower area here where the family would have. Um, gathered to eat 
um, and cook. The upper area, of course, would have stayed warmer. You can see it a little better here, this upper area and this lower area and the remnants of this, this sod house. And then there were tents. Um, tents were constructed um, as housing, usually on a more temporary basis because they were pretty easy to put up and take down. Um, the, originally, the tents were more like the, the photograph at the bottom made of skin and probably some kind of bone, rib bones, or perhaps caribou antlers helping to keep, keep the, the tent up. Um, after colonizers came to the area, you start to see uh, canvas tents, which is what you see on the top. And I stuck this little drawing in by an artist whose name is Shubanai Ashuna. I just kind of liked it. It's, it just shows a, a village, looks like a family, uh, digging for clams, and you can see their tent. Um, of course, there's no dirt, so you can't you don't have you can't have tent stakes and stake your tent down. Um, you have to use big rocks to stabilize it. So again, when you walk in these different areas, you see these um, circular areas lined with rock, which um, denote that somebody was camping there with a tent. And then, of course. We, we all know about igloos, um, just a remarkable example of creative use of um, the environment's resources. And a skilled Inuit could construct a house made out of ice within a couple of hours um, using a long flat, flat knife, he cut blocks of snow and use them to build a wall around himself. The entrance was small and low and often he would build a storage space in front of the igloo for for, uh, for food, for frozen carcasses, or maybe hunting gear. Um, light filtered through the snow blocks um, into the igloo. Uh, pretty amazing. And I'm showing you all of this again because I really want you to have a sense of who we're talking about how they lived, where they lived. Um, what an amazing story, just in terms of survival of human beings. And as the story progresses, it will become even more amazing, I hope, <laughs> to you. All right, so this, uh, this is just a general timeline again of um, things that happened historically for Inuit people. Um, again, they lived in their camps, their family camps. That was what they were accustomed to. Um, but then people started to arrive, missionaries and traders. There was prolific trading, lots of trading posts um, popping up. And unfortunately, what happened is with the history, um, as we know it, um, these inhabitants began to dictate and dominate native populations. Um, the picture in the lower part of this uh, of the screen is a picture of the Hudson's Bay Trading Company. And um, for a time, there was a very profitable trade of fox, um, Arctic fox pelts. Um, this was, uh, you know, Inuit people were good at hunting. They could hunt bring in the pelts, trade for valuable things like food or um, rifles or um, medical supplies, whatever. So it was very val valuable, but eventually that died down. And as that died down, um, they became very poor. Life just got harder and harder. Lots of starvation, even um, up into the 1950s, which is amazing to me. Um, we know, I'm sure you know about the history of residential schools for uh, Native peoples. Residential schools were a reality in the Arctic as well, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but again, things began to change, things became difficult. Residential schools, um, well, I think most of us know the story, and it's not a story that um, we like to be reminded of. But the children were taken from their families who lived on the land. 
Many times they were taken far, far away. Many times the children never were returned to their families or it was forgotten who they belonged to. Um, their hair was cut. They were forced to wear Western clothing. They were forced into a religion that um, was unfamiliar to them and um, they were often abused. I do want to mention that um, in Canada, there's something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This um, was created in 2008 and continues to this day and it acknowledges the wrongdoings of um, the human rights abuses by the Canadian government. Um, all right, uh, anyway, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it's a wonderful thing. Canada is very, very, very conscientious about coming to grips with the um, atrocities in the past and healing. Um, and I'm saying that because there actually is a, some movement here in, in the US um, to do something similar. And I would really um, like to see something like that happen. Okay, so people uh, moved from their camps to um, established settlements. And um, some of them moved voluntarily and some of them were moved, uh, removed forcefully. All right, Cape Dorset. You're gonna be hearing a lot about Cape Dorset now. So in 1913, Cape Dorset um, became a settlement and it is a settlement. I'll show it to you on the map in just a minute. Um, a Hudson Bay Trading Company opened there, which means that it was a place where lots of Inuit people were coming and going to trade. And there were also a couple of churches and a school that was built. So Cape Dorset, um, which is actually called King Knight, um, that's at least the, the inhabitants of that hamlet or settlement prefer to be uh, to call themselves um, um, people of King Knight. Cape Dorset is, is, is what we're more familiar with. This is their flag. And here it is. Um, if you recall a while ago, I showed you a map of Baffin Island. So you see where Baffin Island is in your upper right of the screen. And there's a little red area that, I made mean, a little red arrow that points to the hamlet of um, Cape Dorset. And so we're going to focus on Cape Dorset for the, the rest of our time here. All right, and ah, just a few of my photos. This is, this is us flying over Cape Dorset. Took us three days to get there because of weather. I won't go into it, but it was quite an exciting trip. Here we are landing. You just land on a gravel pad. <laughs> All right, so moving into town meant the end of nomadic ancestral life for, for the Inuit. In Cape Dorset, though, the transition to a new way of life would be captured in the art produced by many of its residents, which would become famous around the world for years to come. So how does art fit into all of this, and specifically Cape Dorset? Um, I'm going to play this for you. It's it's just one minute. It's a little hard to hear and understand because it's very old. The gentleman that you see here is James Houston, who is um, a very important player in this story. Um, so try to hear what he's saying. I wanted you to see it because I'm mostly his just his enthusiasm and excitement about what he's talking about, um, I think is important. So let me play this for you. Let me tell you, give you the gist of what he said. So that was James Houston. That was probably filmed, I don't know, 30 years ago. The gist of the story is that James Houston was given um, 
was was handed this small little caribou carving that you saw in his hand and and he looked at it and he thought oh my goodness this is very old um this is very special and very old and and then when he inquired about it he was told that it had probably been made that same morning and at first he was kind of disappointed because he thought oh my gosh you know it's old and you mean you know they can just whip these up and then it occurred to him yeah it must mean that they can just whip these up. And I think that, you know, the light bulb went on at that point and he realized that um, this was a unique area with unique people who could do unique things. And so that was sort of the beginning of, um, of this new direction, which has continued to this day. So in the 1950s, James Houston did come to uh, Cape Dorset with his family. Um, he was employed by the Can Canadian Department of Northern Affairs, um, charged with the general administration of the community, but specifically he was responsible for um, furthering the production of carvings and some kind of handicrafts as a way of um, creating an economy in Cape Dorset. Again, remember, people have moved from camps. They're not accustomed to living in settlements. Um, and what are you going to do in the middle of, <laughs> of nowhere, really? <clears throat> so this was the beginning, and, and that was um, um, a very important moment. Um, this is a picture of an artist whose name is Pizziola Kashuna. And she says, I became an artist to earn money, but I think I'm a real artist. Um, so many of us who are artists, you know, we, we, we love what we do and we don't do it necessarily um, to make money. We do it because we have to do it and we love doing it. Um, but I think initially for this community, <clears throat> the reality, is that they needed a way, um, they needed a livelihood. And I think they determined that art might be a way of doing that. All right. And so began um, the, the um, a co op. And um, it was formed in Cape Dorset. And it um, is still in existence today. And um, it initially was an, an art co-op and then it expanded. And I, I can't, I'm not gonna go into how that worked. This is a great old picture of um, some of the original people, the original artists outside the co-op when it was formed in the early um, 1950s. So community members were, would pay a membership fee and would join the co-op. Each member would hold equity in the organization. If there's a profit at the end of the year, members received a dividend. Artists are given studio space and materials by the co-op, and then the co-op pays the artists for the, the, the work that they do. And um, again, this has expanded, and we'll talk about that toward the end of our program tonight. Um, but it it was uh, the beginning of um, something uh, new and innovative that made it possible for people to stay in their homeland, homeland and to survive and make a living. And this is um, a, another great old picture that's James Houston in the back. And he's obviously sitting at a table with some young people and they're sharing some of what they probably call handicrafts at, um, at that point. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's talk a little bit before we get into these um, beautiful things, art objects that are made in this um, very interesting area. Um, 
Hold on, I'm just taking a little sip of water. Let me just say this. So to begin with, let's remember that objects of beauty created by human, human beings in this area already existed in the Inuit culture. Um, now, most of the objects initially were utilitarian, right? They were objects that could be used, such as clothing and footwear and utensils and, and things of that nature. Um, it's common in Native communities that utilitarian objects are made to look beautiful, right? To honor someone, uh, perhaps a spiritual entity, or to identify something about its maker, like to show off a little bit, um, to please a higher power. Um, and then, of course, outsiders arrived, and um, they liked what they saw. And utilitarian or not, they saw that they could make these objects that people liked and they could trade them or they could sell them um, so that they could live and, and buy food. And, um, and of course, they had to consider where they lived and the materials that they had to use. I'll, I'll show you some of those materials in just a minute. Before I show you those materials, let me just um, mention a few things about some of the themes in Inuit art that you see, whether you're looking at carvings or drawings or prints or whatever. Keep this in mind as we look at some of the art. Um, you'll see themes about family, community, just place and home or homeland tradition, the environment, animals, spiritual realm, life as it was in the past and as it is today, reciprocity, interconnectedness, transformation, and social commentary. And there's, there are probably others too, but you'll see what I mean in just a minute. So again, let's um, consider the materials. So picture the Arctic lots of stone right lots of rocks so we would expect to see carvings from stone but we also have things like bone bone from whales for example um, or antlers horn ivory from tusks of walrus for example all of these natural resources um, that could be ut utilized in an artistic way so this, for example, is a beautiful little piece that's carved out of walrus ivory. These two pieces are carved from the uh, tooth of the narwhal. I don't know if you've seen a narwhal. It's a toothed whale. Um, and you see them way up north. I love the one on the top. It's, um, it's uh, sort of a transforming narwhal. And so you see it has a human face, and, uh, but it's still in the form of the narwhal. So these are made from that tooth, which you see sticking out here. There are some more narwhals. So, <clears throat> and of course, animals. Dancing bears are very, very popular in Inuit art, as are muskox, birds, and owls. Families, people, traveling, hunting, moving. This little walrus is made of whalebone. You see some other pieces in bone and stone in that picture. These two are made of whalebone. These are both um, suggest some kind of shamanism. The one on your right is a shaman. One on your left is uh, transforming into a shaman, and that is whalebone and caribou antler. This is a magnificent piece also made out of whalebone. And you see that there's some kind of transformation taking place here, human and bird transformation. <clears throat> Muskox horn and caribou antler are often used. Um, as materials in creating some of the carvings. As you see here, the birds are muskox horn. <clears throat> Caribou antler. This is a beautiful um, piece of a family and a home in stone by Lucy Tassier. Families, children, 
the piece on your left is a very old piece, <clears throat> beautiful piece. And I put the picture on top just because it, it mirrors the, the stone carving so beautifully. But notice in the stone carving that um, the woman is tattooed. Tattoos were um, a, a common practice a long time ago. They were traditionally applied to the face um, and the hands of Inuit women. And additionally, they were often placed on um, the thighs, the inner thigh of a woman as a way of beautifying the, ex um, the um, experience of a newborn entering the world. Um, and they symbolized, uh, their purpose was to beautify, also to sim symbolize um, entrance into adulthood, a rite of passage. And the designs um, actually vary depending on the community. This, the one on the lower, in the lower picture is an artist whose name is Helen Kaldak. Um, and I choreographed a dance inspired by her once and you see her beautiful facial tattoos. Um, <clears throat> tattooing was prohibited um, by missionaries and therefore um, it, ceased for a long, long time. It was considered a shamanistic practice. And so women were forbidden to get them, but it has become um, very possible. And I mean, not very possible, but it's become very popular again. And you see some pictures um, of tattoos that are being done today with some uh, women in these communities. And here's just some more examples. I want you to see that, um, um, the sky's the limit when it comes to um, creative pieces for Inuit people. I like this, I pick nose, but not you, <laughs> by uh, Jamasi, uh, Jamasi Pitsiolik. Um, so you see that there are traditional pieces and more contemporary pieces, but they um, still go back to those themes that we talked about earlier what was present in their lives in the past and is present today and, and how those are seen through their art. Okay, getting to pictures from stone. So drawing was something and creating things was something that Inuit people just knew how to do. Um, they, um, they were accustomed to designing um, you know, their, their boats, their sleds, their homes, um, and also their clothing, which I wanted to put some of this in here because again, I think it's a good example of just the, the ingenuity, the utilitarian coupled with the, the, the beautiful um, art, art, artistry, I guess you would say, of some of the clothing made again by what they had, hide, um, often beads which came about later as there was trade. These parkas are amazing. They're made from <clears throat> an entire bird skin. So printmaking, how does it relate to all of this? All right. So um, I'm not going to read this because it's long, but it's another James Houston story where he was um, speaking with, with a Suetuk Ipoli. And um, uh, Mr. Ipoli was, was somehow um, marveling at some heads that were on some, I think they were cigarette packages. Yes. And they were identical. And he couldn't figure out how they could be identical. And um, <clears throat> he inquired about this. And James Houston was trying to explain to him um, how you can make a print of something. You don't have to create it every single time you do it. And so James Houston found a piece of ivory that was carved. And he put some ink over it and took a piece of toilet paper and stuck it up against that pattern and uh, then took it off and he had um, a print of the image that had been um, 
um, engraved into the ivory. And this was a new concept. Um, and again, another light, light bulb went off and James Houston thought, huh, maybe, maybe we could do prints in this community. So he went for four months to uh, Japan and he learned about Japanese printmaking and came back to the community of King Knight or Cape Dorset. And he started a, um, a printing program. And he taught many of the artists who he had been working with um, how to make prints. And this is the long, in Cape Dorset, this is the longest continuous running print studio in Canada. Uh, the first collection of prints was in 1959 and the 2020 um, collection just came out last weekend. It's been happening ever since 1959. Um, and <clears throat> so it's produced yearly. There's tight control over the distribution then and now, and they only do a limited number of prints for each image. And so this is another image from the, um, um, the first collection. And this was um, an image by Kanonganok Kudaguk, who had a very, very long career and actually just died within the last 10 years, Blind Man and the Bear. And I love this Kenojuak. You're going to be hearing me talk about Kenojuak in a minute, rabbit eating seaweed. To me, it's just such a simple but elegant um, print. Graceful, beautiful. So <clears throat> here's a photograph of some of the first um, artists and printmakers that were part of this printmaking co-op. And I've highlighted, highlighted the names Kenojalak, Ashavak, and Pudlo Pudlat um, because I'm going to focus on them because their, those were, their prints were in the exhibit at the museum, the Grace Hudson Museum, if you happen to see that. Um, so um, it starts with the artist um, making a drawing. And then once that drawing is selected, a slab of stone, and of course they have lots of stone there, is um, prepared and made workable as a printing surface. And then the drawing is uh, delineated on the stone by the stone cutter. And you see there that um, um, the, the stone cutter cuts away areas that are not to appear in print, leaving the uncut, uncut areas that are raised in relief. And you can see that there. And then the raised area is inked using um, ink and rollers. One piece of uh, paper is placed on that. It's pressed and inked. And only one print can be made with each inking. And this is Kano Drak with her um, beautiful print called The Arrival of the Sun, which was in the collection of um, the 1962 collection. So I want, let's hope this video is better. This is much newer. Let's hope that the sound is better. Let's see.
All right. Well, I'm so sorry you didn't hear that, but um, I think you you got a sense of um, what they were saying just by watching the video footage. So every year since 1959, there has been a print collection, um, an annual collection, and there usually are about 30 different selections, and they make 50 of each um, print. So here's an example. And um, when you purchase one of their prints, it, you will see one of the things on the bottom will tell you which, um, which print of 50 you are purchasing. Uh, this is, these are just some images of the print collection from last year. As I said, this actually, this weekend, this weekend in two days, uh, the 2020 uh, collections go on sale at, um, at many galleries in um, all over. All right, and, and um, you'll also see if you were to buy an original print, this little symbol, this, this denotes um, that it was made in Cape Dorset. And you'll see in the image um, in the lower right um, what that looks like if it's on the print. And then those two symbols next to each other, those are usually embossed. They're not usually colored on the print, but they're usually embossed in the paper. So, um, at the exhibit in uh, at the Grace Hudson uh, Museum, you saw two beautiful prints, one by Kanoyuak Ashaba and one by Pedro Quadlet. And so I just wanted to show you um, a few more things by Kanoyuak. And uh, I want to tell you a little something about her. This is the beautiful print called Radiant Owl that you saw if you came to the museum exhibit. And um, this is now part of the Gorman Museum collection. And if Selig and Gloria Kaplan are here with us tonight, um, this is from their, originally from their private collection. So Kanojuak, um, one of the first women to engage in the arts project in the 1950s in Cape Dorset, widely recognized. She's probably the most famous of all of the um, Inuit artists. She received the Order of Canada in 1967 and two honorary degrees. In her early years, she lived on the land and then moved from the camp and her traditional life in camp um, to Cape Dorset. She was hospitalized for four years with TB. This was very common with many Inuit people. They, they were hospitalized for TB, sometimes for a long time. She, um, she had 11 children of her own. She adopted five children and seven of her children died in childhood. This too is very common in um, Inuit families. And um, until her death, her, death her, her prints were consistently, uh, probably in almost every collection. Here she is. This is called the Enchanted Owl, and it's probably one of her most famous prints. It was made in 1970 and um, um, was also put on a Canadian stamp. Um, and there were only 50 of these made. Uh, I saw one auctioned off just about a month ago for $200,000. This is another one called Return of the Sun, which was another postage stamp design. Um, you know, if you look at Kenojoak's work, um, you know, she's really well known for her birds, her birds, her owls. Um, um, you'll notice how sort of symmetrical and balanced and just beautiful, just beautiful her um, works are. They're not, um, they don't necessarily tell any deep story, have any deep meanings. They're just um, um, pictures of life around her. I'm going a little faster now because I'm looking at my clock here. We're almost done. The other artist that you, um, whose work you saw in the exhibit was uh, Pudlo Pudlot. And um, 
this was the piece you saw at the Grace Hudson Museum called Spirits in the Arctic from uh, 1989. Um, Pedlow was born in, in 1916. He too was a hunter and grew up on the land. Um, he was married three times, had many children, and all of his wives and most of his children died during his lifetime. He too was hospitalized for a year in Manitoba with TB. Um, and as we look at some of his work, you also will see themes of, um, of times growing up on the land, um, times of the past. And he acknowledged tradition, but he also was pretty savvy about changing times and current times. So we see um, kind of humorous things sometimes, very creative um, paradoxes of encounters between traditional Inuit culture and modern Inuit culture. Is it, I just thought this was an interesting, um, you see the, the stone cut and then the final print that was from the 1961 collection. But again, just notice um, how what he creates is our uh, pictures really from his life and what he remembers, what he has experienced traveling hunters. And you see Inukshuks in here, hunters who perhaps have lost their way or are looking for spring water or a good hunting place and might be able to find that um, by reading the Inukshuks. He was known for his versatility, innovativeness, and his sense of humor. There you go, sense of humor. How did he think of this? He did have a thing about airplanes. Um, think about it, you live in the Arctic, you've never seen anything like that, and suddenly you start seeing airplanes. And of course he was transported on an airplane, I believe, when he had TB. Um, good catch man surfing on a fish. <laughs> Sometimes um, the works have to do with something related to uh, the changing times, something serious like on the left you see, oops, Arctic allegory. And um, if we took time to really look at that, you would see some symbols on that and would, be, would, would begin to think about what that might mean, or the one on the right, which is called highest priest. All right, so um, I, I like this quote, quote, and I'll read it to you. Rather than nostalgic longing to return to the past ways, their intent is to ensure that the knowledge and values embedded in tradition remain part of their present day lives. In essence, their artwork represents resilience and the ongoing renewal of Inuit culture. And this is what Christine Lalonde has to say about Inuit artists today. And briefly, I'll just introduce you to Two of my favorites, Ning TV on the left and Shuvanai Ashuna on the right. And they're both very um, um, well-known artists today who are living today. Um, there's a piece by Ning TV. A couple of years ago, I made Shaman Reveal based on a legend of a woman turning into a fox. I wanted to show how people could change from one thing to another, but still the same, be the same person. Zipper came to mind and I thought, that's a really nice idea. So I used a zipper to show how they change. Ning TV, um, this would be a drawing um, that perhaps has a story attached to it, a legend uh, probably about transformation. Ning is really big. She likes owls and walrus. And um, I love this one. Owl sights a lemming, and you see uh, what's in the owl's eyes. She, a lemming for breakfast. Fun, funny, lighthearted, 
deep in thought, the, the walrus on the left, in case you don't see it immediately, notice the hand that's sticking up under the chin of the walrus, deep in thought. And you know you're in it when is the bird with the different boots. So whereas Ning uh, tends to be quite light and fun, not always, um, Shubhanaya Shuna is uh, something entirely different. Um, very, very inner, inner scapes, inner landscapes. Every day, each colored pencil seems like a new baby. Mysterious landscapes reflect her inner world as much as they inner, illustrate the exterior world. And we could talk, I could talk for hours about Shubhanaya Ashuna. And, and what the heck is going on <laughs> in her brain. But um, we, uh, you know, her, her themes um, seem to be these, these worlds floating around, pools of fish, um, the, the landscape, the tundra, the rocks, people, monsters. It's a very beautiful drawing, looking down at a tent encampment in the rocks. It's a little nest with um, eider duck eggs in it and ulu. Ulus are women's knives in the Arctic and they are used for all kinds of things, including skinning. And, and you might notice if you were to get close up, close up, you could see the ulus in there. I'm not going to show you this video of um, Kenoshua, but I'll end with this. <clears throat> so there's a new center, it was built um in 20 just finished in 2019 and you see at the top here a photograph of where we began with the print shop and where we are now <clears throat> took many years of planning but um now in cape dorset they do have the kenoshwat cultural center and print shop it's 10,000 square feet it has beautiful meeting rooms um, exhibition space print shop, studio space, visitor center. I have not seen it. <clears throat> I was there in Cape Dorset before it was built. And um, there's another video here that's quite wonderful, but since we can't hear, and since I think we've used up most of our time, we might want to stop. And um, I will say that if you go to YouTube, there are many videos. Um, that you can access on <clears throat> Inuit people, Inuit culture, Inuit art. And so I would um, I would recommend that you do that if you're interested in, in seeing more. All right. Yes. So um, there are galleries. Um, uh, many galleries. In fact, I, I don't even, there used to be an Inuit gallery in uh, San Francisco on Union Street. I don't know if it's still there. Um, there are several galleries in Toronto and Ottawa. Um, I do a lot of my shopping in Vancouver, <laughs> since it's on the West Coast, at the uh, Vancouver Gallery. Um, most of the galleries, um, most of the galleries, and I won't say most, but many of the galleries carry the annual print collections. Um, um, they're, they're, they are selected and every year I will go to the Inuit gallery to find out what the collection is. And if I want to purchase one, I usually will purchase one through them. But you can do the same with many of the galleries, as I said, in Toronto, Ottawa. Um, and uh, most of them sell sculptures as well. Some of them specialize, for instance, there is an Inuit gallery in Vancouver, but they only specialize, um, they, they only show really very new, very contemporary Inuit art, um, unlike what we saw today, which much of it is contemporary. Um, but there, there are many places, go online, and um, if you want to do some shopping, you can, uh, Email me, I can tell you where to look. Um, it's easy to shop online.
originally, uh, they were just done with hand tools. Um, you saw, I think, in the video just briefly, someone using a, a, an electric um, hand saw, I guess it was, to sort of uh, carve out sort of a, the, the general shape of the piece. And then a lot of the detail is worked with, with hand tools. So it's definitely transitioned. Um, I, I really love the older pieces. Um, they're, they're much rougher and more rugged, um, and not as polished, and they're all beautiful, but um, I do really appreciate the, um, the older pieces. I, I used to, when I used to talk about this with my students, we'd go, we'd walk outside at the college and I'd have them pick up a stone because, you know, we see stones and we walk by them, but we forget just how heavy and solid and unfriendly they are in terms of carving. And um, it's just a good reminder, I think, to them and for me always of, of, of um, how amazing it is um, that they can be so skillful in, in doing this. All right, so there is a, there's a bigger story um, in terms of the prints. There are actually um, a couple of other communities who have print shops and who do prints. Um, Cape Dorset is um, the biggest and probably the most well-known and uh, the, the most prolific. The reason I'm mentioning that is depending on where you are, um, the stones can differ. For example, the stones in carving. If you um, purchase a piece, for instance, that's um, carved in um, uh, Cape Dorset, it's probably, um, it's sometimes granite, um, sometimes they call it soapstone, which is a softer stone. Um, actually, in Cape Dorset, they are now using, in fact, when we were there, they're using big, um, I think, is it, what is the material that pool tables are made out of? Alan's, Alan? Slate. 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 <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, that's what they're using now. 